Welcome everybody, my name is Anthony James, founder and CEO of linuxacademy.com and cloudassessments.com and co-host of Scale Your Code. And today we're doing a little bit different and we're gonna have a nice conversation with Linux Academy course author, Treva Williams. Say hello, Treva. Hello, Treva. And we're gonna be speaking about containers. Now, container is one of our favorite topics here at Linux Academy, has really, over the past few years, taken the industry by storm. And one of the great parts about containers is it's an open platform, right? We have Kubernetes, we have a lot of different platforms, which means choice comes or becomes open to the end user and consumer. It really empowers a lot of different use cases of which we're gonna talk about today, and maybe even some of the limitations and I think you wrote a blog post on some cool up and coming containers we're gonna to get to called Kata Containers, which I'm personally also exceptionally excited about. So first off, Treva, you had just launched a course on the Red Hat OpenShift platform, and it's a, what, is a Certificate of Expertise course from Red Hat? Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Sure, um, just launched the Linux Academy Red Hat Certificate uh, or Specialty in Platform as a Service prep course um, calling it Certificate of Specialty because they recently changed the name of the Certificates of Expertise. But basically, we're just gonna cover OpenShift administration using the 3.5 platform. And what I'm super excited about is we finally have labs. That was definitely, that was an experience putting those things together. But they're ready and they will soon be out and I'm super excited. Very excited about that too. So for those those listening, a lot of us have learned about containers, right? You know, we know a little bit about Docker. Uh, it really enables a lot of development type use cases, reduces the amount of overhead work developers have to do. But what role does containers play in a platform like OpenShift? It is OpenShift. So how does that work? So let's say I have a container. How does that deploy out? Like how does, how does one scale the code or use OpenShift to scale their platform or host their platforms? So easy. Well, OpenShift describes itself as enterprise Kubernetes. So think of Kubernetes and think of how it might be a little bit not so user friendly from the developer standpoint. OpenShift lays on top of Kubernetes and gives a super friendly UI, super friendly command line so that scaling up or scaling down is, the matter, is a, only a matter of maybe one or two commands or one or two edits to a config file. So when we think about Kubernetes and when we think about the relationship of OpenShift to Kubernetes, uh, for those of you who don't know what Kubernetes is, Kubernetes is what we call a container orchestration platform, which allows us to decide how many containers do we want running over a set of virtual machines or physical hardware. This is actually how we scale out our containers. You might have five virtual machines running with Kubernetes on it. And for example, what we wanna do is run part of our application with containers. It would spread out across those virtual machines and Kubernetes is the orchestrator for that, allowing it to say, hey, this is the number of containers or tasks or whatever it is in your orchestration platform. There's different types of orchestration platforms like Amazon ECS, you have Google Container Service, so on and so forth. And so containers, or excuse me, Kubernetes really empowers the orchestration and scaling of your containers. And so OpenShift, what you're saying, Treva, is basically an easier wrapper around it for developers to deploy out their containers to a platform, maybe just a few clicks of a button, decide or specify uh, how much their applications should scale, what different types or different layers of their application have going in on it, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Now what type of use cases might you say are important for OpenShift? Let's say I'm a developer or I'm working inside of an enterprise company, when might I consider using OpenShift for my application architecture? I would say you could use it from start to end because versioning is super easy in OpenShift. So you can have your development pod where you work out all of your kinks and then with a couple of commands, have the live pod up and running or live pods, depending on how many you're running. Interesting, interesting. So it's one of those ways that you could easily have multiple development environments and even scale back and roll back. So it might allow for easy deployments and roll back of deployments inside of your architectures. So one would say it's, it's could be, is it, what type of services would you say it's similar to? Would you say it's similar to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk when it comes to, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, maybe you're not. Um, but so basically it, it's a platform where developers don't have to worry about architecture. Exactly, yes. 
And that's, and that's really what I love about containers as well, is containers enable us to worry less about architecture. Now, a lot of times in the industry right now, we're hearing the term serverless. And serverless also does something similar, uh, depending on the vendor and cloud vendor that you're using. But believe it or not, the underlying architecture of serverless is very, very strangely close to containers. You define the size of the function that you're gonna run, and it executes. So in other words, it is actually executing on a container, which is what's providing the isolation of your serverless functions underneath the underlying hardware. So for those of you who hope to one day look at a cloud provider or really genuinely understand how cloud architectures work, containers is one of those that we should definitely spend time working on. So the other cool thing about containers, Treva, and we'll talk about this here, is let's talk a little bit about migration of enterprise applications over to the cloud or even multi-cloud. One of the favorite things I like about containers is that I can run a container, doesn't matter where. We can run it on OpenShift, we can run it on Google, we can run it on our local development machine. Whatever is defined by our container configuration file, whether it's the Docker file or whether it's the ECS file or Kubernetes definition that deploys those out, those are easily transferable. And so what type of use cases might you say, let's say I'm an application or an enterprise that has applications on premises, and really what I wanna do is try to migrate that to different, uh, different cloud providers. What type of applications might be useful for that? Gotta think about that one for a second. So let's say your organization is multi-region. Um, see, you've got a base in New York, you've got a base in Georgia, you've got a base over in California, you've got one in London. Anything that needs to be accessed from any of those points quickly, I would say migrate that off-prem. Because in the cloud, what you're going to have, most likely, depending on how you choose to store, is going to be redundancy, multi-region redundancy. That's easier and probably in the long run cheaper in the cloud versus on-prem. Absolutely, and, and I can even relate that too to one of my favorite use cases here, uh, which is actually Linux Academy's own architecture. We run uh, a very interesting architecture. We have a service and microservice oriented architecture where some of our applications are running the serverless framework designed on Node.js. Some of our big data architecture is also designed serverless. But then we have our cloudassessments.com, which is running completely on containers. And we're migrating our linuxacademy.com and have been in the process of migrating that to containers as well. And one of my favorite reasons to talk about that is our original application of Linux Academy was designed as a monolith. And we've spent a lot of time kind of redeveloping this into a service-oriented architecture. And I say service-oriented, microservice-oriented, because it's a hybrid, right? So microservice is almost down to the function. Where service-oriented, you might have an application that performs a specific service within the architecture. And we've been, we, we had a chef set up, automatic deployments, rollbacks, continuous integration pipelines, really, really great. But, you know, when we looked at containers, we saw this really kind of replaces our need to use chef as configuration management, right? So when we think about containers, one thing I really love them for is we don't really have to maintain state, specifically as we're working on scaling, right? You scale up, you scale down. So it's less important for us to run agents on our virtual machines to keep configuration management in place. Really the only use case for that was deploying the code. So instead what we've done is we've created a continuous integration pipeline. And from there really what happens is we define Docker files, we build out the container, we do all that great stuff. And as we commit code to GitHub, it automatically invokes a hook which sends a message to our pipeline to pull the latest version of the application to run it through all of our continuous integration testing, continuous deployment, and it deploys out a new version of that container. And we actually roll on ECS right now, which allows us to set rollbacks and de deployment, different uh, how much to deploy at a time before it deploys out even more. And one of the great things about this is it reduces the amount of work we have to do to manage our overall architecture. So we know that containers are exceptionally powerful, right? And it's one of those things that we're focusing on. But, you know, one of the conversations that I love having with you, Treva, is you're such a huge fan of OpenStack as well. And, you know, it was just the other day I was talking about, you know, it's an almost impossible to put OpenStack and run it on containers. we got to, you know, manage hardware or large-scale virtual machines. And what was your response to that? 
Well, actually, OpenStack can run on containers, and there are two three projects that are currently active that are running on LXC, LXD, that is OpenStack Ansible. And there's also OpenStack Cola that runs on Kubernetes. So that's actually super impressive because for those of you who aren't familiar with OpenStack, envision uh, a version of AWS, but in your own on-premises private cloud, right? It basically is a private cloud uh, deployment, which up until recently was relatively complex to deploy. It required multiple nodes. You had your storage nodes, you had your compute nodes. Uh, do you just want to give us a brief overview of what that is? Like, what, what is OpenStack in general for those who are watching this so they can be just as impressed as I am to hear this type of, this type of news? OpenStack is the best thing ever. That's all you need to know. I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> uh, I mean, you just started a flame war. That's what happened. Hey, I am ready. OpenStack <laughs> is my favorite thing in the, in the world. And it's pretty much like Anthony said, if you wanted to have a cloud, but living on-prem or have a cloud that was completely customized to whatever it is the organization needs, use OpenStack. And it's supported by a huge and beautiful community. Uh, I think in um, Pike, there were over 2,000 contributors to OpenStack, OpenStack code. Mm -hmm. The latest version, is that the latest version, OpenStack Pike? Pike, um, Queens is actually the latest version. Okay. Pike is one step back. Okay. So, I, so what you're saying is I can run my private cloud on my private cloud. Because Kubernetes could and, and has been, in a lot of use cases, to coined the private cloud. Because you can run Kubernetes on-prem, you can use the different services of Kubernetes. So if we think about it, we could have something to manage our virtual machines and compute inside of containers almost, which is interesting. I'm really excited to talk about this use case uh, to see kind of the technology underneath that. But you know, it, with OpenStack, kind of the, the glory and the, and the thought process behind that was private cloud. And w what I think a lot of people maybe misunderstand is, is the purpose of a private cloud. There's a lot of times we should be doing, uh, you know, prototyping and ta beta testing, even for just for whatever reasons. Maybe your organization just isn't prepared to embrace everything public yet, an on-premise component. And quite frankly, there's still a lot of organizations out there that have a, a virtual machine set up inside of their on-premises, right? And so think about it. If we were to set up Kubernetes, like we're kind of going back to Kubernetes here, but you set up in your local machines, you containerize your applications. And if Kubernetes is a standard on-premise, on-premises, and Kubernetes is a standard in the cloud, what if I could just flip a switch to send what's here up here? What if I could have multi-cloud load balancers, and you see this with AWS's new uh, hybrid load balancer where you can have the load balancer between cloud resources and your on-premises resources, but now you all of a sudden got this private cloud architecture that's a public cloud architecture that you can scale on demand, send your cloud applications to on-premises, send your on-premises applications to the cloud, have backup and disaster recovery, and that's really kind of the glory of containers, is it's a standard everywhere and it's easy to just send here, send back. Now, Treva, you recently wrote a blog post on linuxacademy.com, and I just want to hear it from yourself because it was a great blog post about a new project which you're insanely interested about of something called Kata Containers. Now, before we dump, jump into that, for those of you who don't know, containers, at times, depending on where we are and the type of user namespaces and C groups and all that stuff on how containers work with the Linux kernel, but essentially it shares certain components in a way, right? Just like virtualization shares the hypervisor, containers share at times certain components of a kernel in order for it to work. That doesn't know it's shared, just like a hypervisor doesn't really know that it's being shared. But CATA containers, allow you to take, and let me get this straight, I'm gonna let you talk all about it, but to make sure I understand this, CAD, am I pronouncing it right, CATA containers? Mm -hmm. CATA containers allow you to take an entire Linux kernel and containerize it. Pretty much. So tell me about this project. Well, it's still under development. I think an alpha version was just released that people are still playing with, so the project isn't quite ready yet. But the theory, and from the demo that I saw at, at um, where was I? KubeCon. <laughs> At KubeCon, each container will have its own separate customized kernel 
so that it has basically a complete and utter lockdown within that container, which pretty much eliminates the majority of vulnerabilities that come with running containers on a hardware or virtual machine, but it doesn't lose any of the speed that you would expect from launching a container. Sorry. <laughs> Pause for effect. <laughs> So you have all of the security of running a physical machine or a virtual machine locked down in this little bitty tiny sliver of a container on shared resources up to a certain point at least. And it's just incredible and I am super excited and I cannot wait to get my hands on it. I've got so many plans. Oh, I, I gotta tell you, I'm excited about it too. Because if you think about it, so Nirvana of having, when you need it, Right, and if it runs at the speed of containers, obviously it might require a little bit more resources since you have the entire kernel in there, but it's fast. Maybe a little bit more memory or disk size or? Well, disk size, that, that kind of, it depends on what it is that you're running within that container, but the speed, I think it loses like 0 0.005 milliseconds of speed compared to just a regular plain container. It's so fast, it's amazing. That's incredible. That basically means that, we, that this project has solved every potential use case that we could have with containers, right? So if you think about it, if there is a use case of putting something in a container, depending on the type of container, LexD, LexC. Of course, LexD is the uh, daemon for LexC, for those of you out there watching, which means it just is the control wrapper. Uh, you have Docker containers. You have, what, rocket containers. You have, um, and now you have CATA containers, which allow you to put the, basically an entire virtualization inside of a container. So it, it really looks like as we look at the future of enterprise, the future of B2B applications, the future of really applications in general, we have two things behind there. Uh, I would venture to say it's gonna be all containers, and if you're running serverless, it's going to be executing on containers. So, and you know, the one thing I like about, and I know serverless is a big thing out there, we're getting on board with it as well, we have a lot of applications running that. The one thing I like about containers compared to serverless is I can take it to any provider. I can take it on premise, I can take it to Google, I can take it to Azure, I can take it to AWS, I can send it across, I can run it multi-load balancing across all of them. And with the cloud providers all moving to basically hardware list container services, which is basically container as a service, which is basically serverless containers, it's, it's, it's really pretty phenomenal. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how it develops over the years. Uh, I would say that from B2B applications that still require management and architecture and system administrators, containers is gonna be where it's at. And I would say that we're gonna still continue seeing a lot of use cases with serverless. And quite frankly, uh, I'm going to venture to guess that serverless DevOps is going to be a relatively large thing as well, using uh, serverless tools to administer and automate deployment and security of containers and even your existing virtual machines inside the cloud as well. So this was really good, Treva. Uh, big fan of containers, and I'm a big fan of your OpenShift course and your OpenShift labs too. That was uh, quite a feat that we got those running, so good job on that. For those of you who like this podcast, please feel free to join us at Linux Academy Com on Twitter, Linux Academy Com on Facebook, YouTube, and my name is Anthony James, and you can follow me at Anthony D. James on Twitter and connect with me on LinkedIn. And we look forward to sharing more with Linux Academy course authors in the future. Nice job.